Most mechanical engineers don't fail interviews or projects because they don't know theory or equations, but because they've never been pushed to solve the kind of problems that reveal true engineering thinking. Today, we'll walk through four questions that separate the top performing mechanical engineers from everyone else. These cover the things that matter the most in practice, including tolerances, materials, product design, testing, manufacturing, and reliability. If you can't work through these questions, you'll very likely struggle in interviews and definitely on real projects where your decisions make or break a design. I'll present each question, give you a moment to think, and then we'll go step by step through the solution, covering the technical reasoning, calculations, and principles you need to know. Think of it as a mini job interview, but without the stress. Whether you're a student or working in industry, these are questions that every mechanic mechanical engineer should be able to answer. Let's start with the first question. You have a shaft with a nominal diameter of 20 millimeters plus minus two hundredths of a millimeter and a hole with a nominal diameter of 20.05 millimeters plus minus two hundredths of a millimeter at room temperature or 20 degrees Celsius. The shaft is steel with a thermal expansion coefficient of 12 times 10 to the minus six per Kelvin. The housing is aluminum with a thermal expansion coefficient of 23 times 10 to the minus 6 per Kelvin. The operating temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. The question is, will the sliding fit still work during operation? Pause the video, take 30 to 60 seconds to think about it, which is how much time you would typically have in an interview. Later. So the short answer is yes. With the steel shaft and an aluminum housing, the fit actually becomes looser at operating temperature. The worst case clearance increases from 10 microns at room temperature to approximately 28 microns at 100 degrees Celsius. At 20 degrees Celsius, the shaft diameter range is 20 plus or minus two hundredths of a millimeter, giving us 19.98 to 20.02 millimeters. The whole diameter range is 20.05 plus minus two hundredths of a millimeter, giving 20.03 to 20.07 millimeters. The worst case clearance is the minimum hole minus the maximum shaft or 20.03 minus 20.02, which equals one hundredth of a millimeter or 10 microns. The nominal clearance is simply 20.05 minus 20, which equals five hundredths of a millimeter or 50 microns. Next, we have to account for thermal expansion from 20 to 100 degrees Celsius. The linear expansion formula is simply delta L equals alpha times L sub zero times delta T. For the steel shaft, alpha is 12 times 10 to the minus six per Kelvin, L sub zero is 20 millimeters, and delta T is 80 Kelvin. Multiplying, we get a shaft expansion of 19 thousandths of a millimeter. For the aluminum housing, alpha is 23 times 10 to the minus six, giving a whole expansion of 37 thousandths of a millimeter. So at 100 degrees Celsius, the shaft nominal diameter is 20.019 millimeters, and the whole nominal diameter is 20.087 millimeters. For worst case conditions, the shaft maximum is 20.02 plus 0.0192, which is 20.039 millimeters. The whole minimum is 20.03 plus 0.0368, which is 20.067 millimeters. The clearance is 20.067 minus 20.039, which equals 0.028 millimeters or roughly 28 microns. So the clearance increases from 10 microns at room temperature to approximately 28 microns at operating temperature. So always account for differential thermal expansion and material shrinkage. Aluminum expands more than steel, so the hole grows faster than the shaft. This makes the sliding fit looser when heated, reducing the risk of the shaft seizing. On paper, at room temperature, the worst case clearance is only 10 microns, which is very tight, but still acceptable. Heating provides extra clearance, but in practice, you must also consider factors like surface finish, assembly temperature, and potential thermal gradients. So the key takeaway here is don't just look at the nominal numbers. Think about the operating environment, material shrinkage or expansion, surface conditions, and the assembly process. This is how real mechanical engineers ensure parts and systems always fit and perform under real-world 
material conditions. Moving on, the second question focuses on material selection. You're designing a lightweight UAV motor mount bracket that bolts directly to a carbon fiber reinforced polymer frame. The constraints are fully reverse cyclic loading of about five kilonewtons, a target life of 10 to the seven cycles, operation in a coastal salt spray environment, minimal maintenance, maximum thickness of six millimeters, and a small batch production of less than 200 units. Isolation washers or bushings are allowed, but field assembly is inconsistent. Which of the following materials is the best primary choice. The options are A6061 T6 aluminum with clear anodized, B7075 T6 aluminum with hard anodized, C titanium aluminum vanadium grade 5 alloy, and D174 pH stainless steel H900. Go ahead and take a minute to think about it and then we'll go over the solution. Later. The best choice here is C titanium grade 5 alloy. So in a system containing multiple dissimilar materials, especially in direct physical contact with each other, I like to first consider any chemical reactions that might occur. Carbon fiber reinforced polymer behaves as a noble electrode in a wet or salt environment due to its carbon network. Aluminum paired with carbon fiber reinforced polymer will galvanically corrode rapidly if the anodized coating is damaged, even with isolation washers. Titanium, on the other hand, forms a stable oxide layer and is galvanically organically compatible with carbon fiber, which eliminates this corrosion risk. Next, think about things like strength and fatigue. At a maximum thickness of six millimeters, we need high specific strength and fatigue resistance. 7075 T6 aluminum delivers exceptional strength, but is vulnerable to stress corrosion cracking in chloride environments and at scratched edges. 6061 T6 aluminum, on the other hand, is less strong, which could force us to in increase thickness and compromise weight targets. 17.4 pH stainless steel offers good strength and fatigue performance, but has a density around 7.7 grams per cubic centimeter, making it significantly heavier than aluminum or titanium and therefore unattractive for aggressive UAV mass budgets. Titanium aluminum vanadium alloy combines high specific strength, excellent fatigue properties, and low density, making it an excellent choice for small lightweight UAV components when cost and manufacturability allow. Finally, consider manufacturing. Although titanium is slower to machine than aluminum or steel, small batches of less than 200 units make this acceptable. Threads can be machined or reinforced with helicoils or key locking inserts, and titanium eliminates the galvanic corrosion risk present with aluminum. So titanium grade five is the best overall option if budget allows and you must hit strict weight and fatigue targets at less than six millimeter thickness. The lesson here is material selection should not be guided by strength alone or any individual single property or factor. An optimal choice must also account for environmental factors, service variability, long-term reliability, cost efficiency, and manufacturability to ensure both technical and economic feasibility. Question three involves a smartphone drop test. In real world scenarios, simply looking at stress in the frame isn't enough. A phone might remain under material yield stress, but the glass can still crack at edges or corners due to impact concentration. The question is, how would you set up and leverage a design of experiments or DOE to analyze fracture risk? Pause and take one to two minutes to think about it, and then we'll discuss the solution. Later. Design of experiments or DOE allows us to study the relationships and interactions between multiple input factors instead of testing them in isolation. Take the smartphone drop test scenario. We can vary frame material, glass type, corner reinforcement, and drop orientation, then measure how each combination affects fracture probability. DOE not only shows us the main effects, but also the interactions. For example, sapphire glass by itself is brittle, but if we combine it with reinforced corners, the fracture risk 
drop significantly. That's an interaction effect you would never see by testing factors one at a time. So we can quantify fracture risk in two ways. First is probability of fracture. We can run multiple virtual drops with slight random variations in angle, height, and velocity. The fraction of simulations that result in cracking gives a statistical probability. Second is average crack area. Using finite element methods like XFEM or cohesive zone modeling, we can track crack initiation and propagation and average across trials to measure severity. These metrics reveal real world outcomes much better than just looking at stress alone. To set up any DOE, we define ranges or levels for each input factor and build a test matrix. Putting everything together, the matrix shows how different input combinations translate into different performance outcomes. Here's a simplified example of a DOE matrix for a smartphone drop test. So the first design of experiments would be broad and it shows us which factors matter most. From here, we can refine and focus on top performing combinations, narrow tolerances, and rerun the DOE. Finally, we would validate the best candidates with physical drop tests tests to ensure the simulations hold up in real life. The key here is that design of experiments doesn't give a single right answer, but instead reveals trade-offs between multiple inputs or factors. Maybe one combination minimizes fracture probability, another minimizes crack area, and another balances weight and cost. The mechanical engineer's job is to interpret these trade-offs and to choose the best solution for the design goals. Now, before we can continue one of my favorite platforms that was a game changer in preparing me for a career in mechanical engineering was Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and problem solver with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Brilliant's lessons build problem solving skills by allowing you to experiment with concepts. This method is proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Brilliant's lessons are crafted by professors, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, and Google, so you learn from the best. Brilliant promotes critical thinking through active learning, not memorization, so you become a better thinker. It also helps develop the habit of daily learning, essential for both personal and professional growth. You can level up at home or on the go with Brilliant's interactive bite-sized lessons. One of my favorites is Brilliant's math courses that build your mathematics mathematical intuition while making you a better thinker and problem solver by focusing on real world problems. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash engineering gone wild, scan the QR code on screen, or click on the link in the description below. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. The fourth and final question relates to a manufacturing drawing exercise. Exercise. You're tasked with creating a drawing for a zinc alloy die cast part with two holes for stainless steel shafts. The nominal diameters are 20 millimeters and 30 millimeters and the holes are intended for a transition fit for press assembly. The instructions are draw only the necessary 2D views using either first angle or third angle projection, show hidden lines with dotted lines and hole axes with stripe dot stripe lines, and specify all dimensions including hole and shaft tolerance. Pause the video, take about five minutes to complete this exercise, and we'll go over the solution. A few minutes later. First, determine the necessary views. Many mechanical engineers like to jam pack a drawing with excessive and unnecessary views and dimensions. For this part, front, top, and side views are sufficient to define all critical features. Next, select a projection. Third angle projection is standard in the US, while first angle projection is common in Europe and India. Label your drawing and which projection you're using clearly in the title block. Hidden features such as through holes are represented with dotted lines and hole axes are indicated with stripe dot stripe lines. For dimensions, specify overall length, width, 
height and the location and diameter of each hole. The 20 and 30 millimeter holes require tolerances appropriate for press assembly. Notice the question says transition fit with press assembly. This is actually poorly worded. A press fit is considered an interference fit rather than a transition fit. Props to you if you caught this subtle detail. Many engineers might immediately think H7 and G6, which is a light sliding fit. That's actually incorrect if we need a press fit. The shaft must always interfere slightly with the hole. So the correct choice is H7 and P6, which guarantees controlled interference for a press fit. So the tolerances for a press fit for a 20 millimeter hole and shaft would be hole H7 is between 20 and 20.021 millimeters and shaft P6 is between 20.022 and 20.035 millimeters. For the 30 millimeter hole and shaft, hole H7 would be between 30 and 30.025 millimeters and the shaft would be between 30.026 and 30.042 millimeters. This ensures a controlled press fit that is tight enough for assembly but avoids damage. Since this part is zinc alloy die cast at draft angles of 1 to 2 degrees on vertical walls for mold release and fillets of 1 to 3 millimeters on corners to aid flow and improve structural integrity. These considerations along with proper dimensioning and fit selection are what separate a good mechanical engineer from a great one. And that officially wraps up our mini job interview. Each question highlights the kind of thinking a mechanical engineer needs to apply, considering materials, mechanical and thermal effects, manufacturing constraints, and real world variability. Of course, there are many more important topics we didn't cover here, but this gives you a realistic taste of what mechanical engineers face on the job. If you work through these questions alongside me, congratulations, go reward yourself. Mastering these concepts will give you a strong head start in your career definitely let me know how you did in the comments below all right guys that's it for today as always thank you so much for watching if you found this video helpful be sure to check out my video here where i cover several serious mistakes that even experienced mechanical engineers make and i'll see you in the next one peace